did you have any thoughts about, um, yeah, about when Bremner, you know, a, a rookie NPA counselor, just kind of on council for a few months, started making some of these well, statements and moves? And bring- better than that, I had a conversation with him before oh, we great. ran. Oh yeah, and we talked about this extensively. And, yeah. and I thought, well, Hector, this is <laughs> this is pretty chewy stuff. And you do understand that for the NPA, the third rail at least when I was around, is you don't touch the single-family neighborhoods. That is your base. And I always have to say, of course, that uh, during that period in the 90s, we had the opportunity to handle the demand for housing through the maker projects and the other rezonings like downtown south. So there were thousands of units coming onto the market, and it did have an ameliorative effect. Uh, No one expected, of course, the run-up in in prices, and I think there's a variety of reasons for that. But nonetheless, we still had an understanding that if there's going to be change in the RS1, in the single family, even in the uh, stable, medium-density neighborhoods like Grandview, Woodland, even the West End, uh, it was going to be a slow, incremental process. be a lot of consultation, have to be community support. You weren't going to go in and change the character or scale of those neighborhoods en masse. The one example that I'm, I think we can all be very proud of is that we were able to deal to a great extent with the secondary suite problem, the illegal suites. The, uh, we didn't actually make the final decision, interestingly, done by a COPE council, but we started that change. But it's a really good example because it meant no change to the look and the scale of the neighborhood, even in a sense if you doubled the density. Same with lane cottages. You know, the way there is Brent Totter in the past city planner called it's, it's invisible or hidden density. And that, those neighborhoods are, they're our DNA. This is a city that was built out of single-family houses along streetcar lines. There's a reason people feel passionate about it. And I think that's true for immigrants as much as it is for long-standing Vancouverites. They may translate it as an asset, but it's a set of values. It's the feel. It's the tradition. And to say you're going to go in and do a cross-the-city rezoning of all of that, first of all, I just don't think it's politically possible. I think you would find there was so much resistance. The political capital that you would have to spend would be too great. More than that, you don't really have to. There are ways of dealing with this. We tried with city plan. So, Hector, uh, don't think that's traditional NPA, and I'm, I'll be impressed if you manage to get elected with that as a plank, and damn it, he did. He did get elected, and in the by-election, which I mean, you fair could say enough, a pretty small turnout and well, okay, votes yeah, that's a qualification. Split. Yeah, but but you got he did. He got well, he got the MP nomination first, which was something, and right. then yeah, and then got elected. Should say on the side that Gene Swanson also touched a third rail, and that was progressive property tax. He uh, called it a mansion tax, but yeah. but nonetheless, that was considered pretty much not only untouchable, but you couldn't touch it. The city doesn't have the authority to do that, but. It was, again, a message that she was sending out, like Hector, that things have to change. And then she did pretty well for an independent. Right. So it showed that those were now going to be, those issues were now going to be part of the political dialogue. Were you surprised to see that? Yeah, no. I mean, once you get elected and you run on that, then that's what you get. Right? You put your position out there. The voters affirmed it. Now, indeed, you're obliged to follow through, and Hector was prepared to do that, ran for the NPA on more or less that kind of platform. And was that the reason why they turned him down? I think that must have been part of it, but not informed enough to know. It could have been just that Chernin was able to stack the board and and get him out of there so he had a clear run for the nomination. Um, Yeah, I mean, that's something that I had heard from some longtime NPA members even uh, before Bremner's candidacy was rejected, they were saying that for some of these guys, the reason they were backing Cooper, the, the reason they thought he was a better candidate than Bremner, is that they were concerned about the policies Bremner had already started. Sort of, he, he started introducing motions about, you know, that, that one about rezoning West Point Gray to allow for more kinds of housing. West Point Gray. West Point Gray of ah. all places. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's that, that was a that was one thing. Uh, one longtime MPA member mentioned to me. He said, you know, he wanted to build apartments at Drummond Drive. Oh. But in fairness, uh, yes, West Point Gray, but also Grandview Woodland. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, it's, it's a change in the scale or character. And it, it, if you're introducing anything, uh, high-rise, say, 12 stories, rather than the four- or five-story traditional apartment building, 
that too can set off this anxiety. Uh, it's a fearful of the precedent that will lead to something worse. So you'll get, uh, as we did in Grandview Woodland, the council found out pretty quickly that, that any proposal that was, in a sense, out of the character of a neighborhood as defined by the community. And so to try and rezone the city all at once, to me, is not only politically very risky, it's probably impossible to do it. I doubt you would be able to get a majority on council when they saw what the blowback would be. But again, this is what this election is going to tell us. This is a generational election, in my opinion. Mm. Literally, mm. in the sense we will see you know, the rise of the millennials and what impact they have. But more than that, I do think Vancouver now, for the first time since the 70s, has become, a, in a sense, a different kind of city that requires a different sort of political response. And that's because of the impact of the cost of, cost of housing. Any predictions about what we'll be, what we'll see sort of in the horse race? Uh, we'll get a better sense of that. Uh, again, this will come down to some extent arithmetic, who can get the vote out, how motivated they are, how great those constituencies are. It could well be that, in fact, there isn't as large a dug-in save-our-neighborhood constituency. Many of them may have cashed out. Uh, however, it would be my belief, too, that the people who've moved in, they may be, quote, relatively fresh off the plane, but they're going to value that single-family look, that kind of British garden city. Well, we found this with the Concord Pacific Project on the North Shore of False Creek. There was a lot of thought, well, we're building little Hong Kong. Right. A lot of migrants coming in, that's where they're going to go. They're familiar with it. It's their lifestyle. No, no, no. They wanted single-family housing. Uh, they wanted to buy dirt. Yeah. They wanted the lifestyle you couldn't get. Right. Uh, and every culture, I think, I'll generalize, has as an icon of its culture a single-family house. Whether it's a little house on the prairie or Downton Abbey, you know, they provide that iconic meaning to people. And Vancouver has a lot of it in these traditional neighborhoods. So if people are prepared to vote for someone like Bremner, or indeed all the candidates seem to be saying one form or another, that the city really now has to change and provide for a greater chart choice of housing and that gets some blowback people understand the stakes in the election that's what will tell us as to whether the city really is ready for change but I can't predict at this point where it's, where it's going to go sure sure um, ex I mean even with the the new 10 year housing strategy that the vision majority account council has recently approved within yeah. I guess the last last year last few months uh, that one, I mean, included sort of some of that middle density, more, like opening up more areas of the city to duplexes, triplexes, townhouses. Candy Corridor. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you, that's how you do it. You, you take a place where it makes a lot of sense and it's ready for change. So clearly the Canby Corridor and the Canada line. And, and you approach it incrementally in the sense that it's going to build out over a number of years. People will have a chance to see how it works, how it feels, what the demand is how we can do it better, but at least it will give some comfort. It won't be a very strange externality that you're imposing on communities in a way that will be disruptive. If you can get to the point, particularly if you can build four, six, eight plexes, uh, a form of housing, by the way, that goes right back to the origins of the time when cities like Vancouver were first being built, the Portlands, uh, yeah. the Seattle's. Well, even if you That's look great like stuff. Strathcona, which I guess is kind of the yeah. original uh, residential neighborhood, has plenty of those row houses, and, well, which we didn't uh, see as many bit. of. A little bit. This shows you a lot about the nature of Vancouver, if we can get into that. Because we were one of the first cities to build almost solely around the electric streetcar, it mm -hmm. was a revolutionary mm -hmm. change in transportation, because it opened up cheap land. And so it was possible for the first time that the average working person could afford to buy their own lot, build their own house. Uh, and, you know, this was a, a real sense of status. As well, everybody else could do the same, so it established this kind of norm. Went from the West End and Strathcona, largely single-family housing, all the way out, really, to the Fraser. These were the neighborhoods in the 60s with the rebuilding of the West End, and we saw density come in. But we jumped over row housing. We jumped over apartment districts. We went directly to single-family housing. That's why that issue is so important to people. As I say, it's in our DNA. Now, it's also two, three, four million dollars. Yeah. So it's got to change. But our the sensitivity with which you do it, the confidence that you have both in 
your planning department and the development community and the willingness of neighborhoods to accept it will determine whether it's successful. 